or contribute to the full spectrum of um, prevention, treatment, recovery. Um, so just, you know, um, and, oh, and including telehealth, because that's a big piece of the uh, uh, FOA as well. Um, so that's it. Um, where was I? 35, 40? Yeah. Told you I was terrible at that. Um, but yeah, so that concludes my sermon. And um, if there are any questions on that less than scintillating approach to performance management, I'm happy to take some. All right. Wake your neighbors up. Ready, Pam? Awesome. So our next speaker. I introduced you earlier, right? Florida, 20 years, credible stuff. Thank you. <laughs> you want this? The only thing I would like to mention, um, because it's where I really learned most Here, of what I learned. This. great program happening in um, public housing to help families, the whole family, with a drug use problem, uh, can you come see it? And you know, my calendar is like lots of, lots of you were just totally slammed, but they made these two magic words, they said it was in Key West. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll find a way to clear a little room in my schedule and go down there. And I was very skeptical because I thought, what in the world does a, a housing authority know about treating families? And so, I, and I went with the head of HUD at the time, we both flew down, and we were walking around not expecting to be impressed, and it blew me away what I saw. We saw families sitting, drinking lemonade on their front porches. We saw, you know those little, little blue pools you get at like the Dollar General that are like little hard plastic? Kids in their bathing suits playing in these little blow up pools. Um, teenagers playing basketball on the basketball court. It was like uh, people grilling out on the grills. It was entire families, all in recovery, all ages. Nobody made them choose between their recovery and some of their children. You know, you can take the babies, but not the toddlers, or you can't take anybody over 10. You know, it was however you define your family, come on down, bring them. And, we had, and they used existing public housing. And so it was an absolutely incredible program. I left, I was very humbled. And I thought, I hope we need these in every town in America. But how do we, you know, how do we go about that? And so when I left, um, I remember them saying, this is going to all go away. Our grant runs out with HUD, and it'll be over in a matter of a few weeks. And I was devastated, because it was, I've never seen at that point, 20 years, never seen anything like it. And so I said, it, 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 I will help you write a grant. I will help you get this thing sustained. And so we did. We got money from SAMHSA from the residential women and children. So then they went to hire somebody, and nobody would stay. Nobody lasted more than three months. And, and I heard from many of you issues with turnover. Well, the, finally I said to them, when they said, we're giving the grant back, we can't keep anybody here, I said, I will do it. Even though I'm not African American, Hispanic, Latina, or a lesbian woman, which is who we prioritize for this program and all their families, before you give the money back, I'll do it but you have to move me in to public housing so I can at least learn what these families, what their struggles are, what, what, is, what, is, what are their challenges. So, and you're familiar with the be careful what you ask for, <laughs> you might get it. And so I was there for, I say five months, two weeks, and seven hours. But it totally revolutionized and changed the way I figured out treatment needs to be done. Everything I learned in school, threw it away. All my credentials, threw them away. I learned firsthand that what we were doing in treatment was so missing the mark in then what these families really needed. We were way up here, and most of these families had not had any real experience or any foundations to build on. And we were coming in, my favorite story, and then I'll jump to our sustainability chat, is that um, I was living there. So I noticed these parents were not getting any better at all at parenting. They, it was terrible. But we had this gold standard parenting program. Came in a shiny box, had a nice little label on it. It was evidence-based. And finally, we, you know how data tells you something happened, but it doesn't tell you why? The data said 
uh, the clients were 100% failing the pretest, 100% failing the post-test. So we said, why? It doesn't, you know, you don't know why are they failing. So finally we took them aside and they said, Miss Pam, you know what one ingredient is missing in your parenting classes here in your treatment program? Does anybody want to take a guess what it was? Children. They said, you ask us these really abstract things. Pretend that you're having this conversation. Pretend you're parenting your child. They said, you know, that's way out there. So it got very messy. We started bringing the kids in and letting them practice parenting with kids. And we learned you can't practice with your own kids. You know, too many dynamics. So they would switch up. So we, we and, and this is an important story because it's what some of you have told us as we've had the technical assistance visits for the last couple days that you really have learned a lot about the population you work with and you know best what they need. But what you're trying to do is take what you know and then what the requirements of this initiative are and somehow make these go together in a way that everybody can be happy about. And that, that's, that can definitely be done. And that's what we'll talk about. Um, and so uh, that, was, that was a very important lesson. And I learned, we literally threw out just about everything we had going. And we did work with the University of Miami School of Medicine with Dr. McCoy. Uh, and that was what he referenced earlier about Key West. Um, so I, I share that because it really changed uh, how I look, uh, look at uh, treatment. And, and we learned a lot of lessons and made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I had a, a very hard uh, SAMHSA project officer who turned out to be one of the best examples because she said, don't, don't hide your failures. We need to learn from them. If you make a mistake, put it in your report. And I'm like, oh, no, we can't possibly do that. We'll, get, we'll lose our funding. You know? And she's like, no, I want to see it. You can't, it's not all unicorns and butterflies and rainbows. You know, we know you're, these are hard you know, things that you're working with, hard problems to solve in families that need a lot of support. So anyway. Um, so what, um, what uh, we learned from those experiences, and I've now been in all 50 states and worked also with a number of tribes, that um, this is very hard work to sustain. And do, am I moving slides or are you? Yeah, key, key little piece of information I neglected to get, sorry. Okay. So um, basically, I also learned from talking with many of you on the technical assistance visits that you're really, everybody's in a very different place. We have grantees that have $50,000 that have never done anything like this before, that don't know where to start. We have folks that have multi-million dollar contracts. So we, we're, what we're going to try to do here, and I've modified the presentation, is to give you something that everybody, some t nuggets that everybody can benefit from. Um, and many of these are lessons that were learned very diff in a very difficult way about how to sustain programs. So just a definition real quick, the ability to maintain programming and the benefits. That's a key word, why I like this definition over the many others. You're not just maintaining your program. You're maintaining the benefits. What is working? You get rid of what's not working. You always want to focus on what is working. And it's also not just about finding future funding sources. So obviously, uh, that is a key piece that we'll talk about. And while every one of you that we've met with on our team for the past two days and those we've had calls with are very different in where you are in your development and capacity building, there is a common denominator that everybody had, and that was passion. And you know, you can learn all this other, the mechanics of how you do things, but you can't learn passion. Either you really have it and you care and you want to do the right thing and, and you're ready to, to have these um, difficult challenges and embrace them and, and succeed, uh, or you don't, but all of these other things you can learn. So we have a responsibility to our program recipients. They've had so many losses in their lives, and for us to come in in a year or two, uh, or three, give them hope only to snatch all of this away, uh, is just really, it's one more loss for them, and they've had so many losses, and it loses hope, and we, that's not, we don't, none of us would ever want that to happen. So we're gonna talk about some very practical solutions. We're only gonna focus on one or two things, and then I also want to open it up to those of you in the audience because there are some great examples of things that are happening out here that we would like to share. So we want to make sure all your hard work pays off um, and to understand the factors that contribute to sustainability. Um, and we're really about capacity building. Um, we're only going to talk about one major sustainability domain in this time frame, but you'll have the PowerPoint with everything. We think about sustainability as ingredients, you know, that all of these ingredients work together to make a successful um, 
uh, sustainable program. And the first one we're going to talk about is partnerships. And it's funny because many of you shared, and I won't say who, you know, oh, we had this grant writer write this grant for us. And, you know, there was a very compressed time frame, right, to get these things in. You had somebody told me she did hers in two days. Uh, some of you had two weeks, but there was not a lot of time. And some of you didn't know that this was even coming, so you didn't have time to really prepare, you know, the soil to make it fertile for your program. And yet you didn't want to pass up on this opportunity, right? So you, you just go for it and you do the best you can. And then when, when the dust settles and you get that great you know, notice of funding award and, you, and then you say, I better go look through that grant, that, uh, grant my grant writer wrote, and you're saying, oh my goodness, I probably would never have promised all of these things, you know, or, or um, we can't do that. We don't have the capacity for that. And I see so many of you laughing, smiling. We heard this over and over and over. So that you're in good company. If that happened to you, you're not a, a very, you, in a unique situation. But um, what I'm hoping we can cover today will help you move from where you are now and take a, a first step or two that might really position you for success. So the first is partnerships. And really, when you think about partnerships, um, these are not just pipelines, right? Because your partnerships, many of them are your referral pipelines. That's how you're going to get the recipients that, to come to you so that you can provide your service to them, whatever that service is. Um, but some of them will be how you sustain your program. They will be, because what you will be doing will provide some benefit to them. And so what, what, many, what I heard from many of you is, well, we have to get out our MOUs. And we're like, okay, yeah, MOUs, that's important, but you, there's a couple steps before the MOU. And that is developing connections and developing really strong uh, understanding um, and, and basically one of your roles is to make sure the partners understand who it is that you are planning to help. And then you need to understand how do those individuals show up in their systems. And so I'm going to run you through a couple. Um, child welfare. So, and I do a lot of work in child welfare. And I was on a, a call the other day with this foster parent and she said, and I, I was so grateful for her honesty. She said, I hate bio moms, bio, meaning biological moms, bio moms. And I was so struck by how angry she was when she said it. And she says, you know, when you, when you have that baby, and she got hers when he was four months old, and she said, and I have him for a couple of years, and I know I have to give him back, and he can't chew his food, he can't, um, what was the other thing, he couldn't, um, he wasn't reaching any of his milestones, he would choke a lot when he would try to eat, and he couldn't say any words at all. He wasn't having, she, she said he couldn't even say ABC at age two. She was very worried. And she said, I know that a lot of that is because of mom's um, substance use in utero. She says, and we don't know that, but she says, I'm quite certain that's what it is. And she said, every time I look at him struggling, I hate her. Well, we were like, we were on the phone, we were doing the conference call. We were all like, you know, holding our breath, like, what do we say? So we said nothing. We let her talk. And she said, and you know what changed? Because you could tell she, it was going to go somewhere positive, thankfully. She said, um, does, do any of you remember having kids and having the, what they call the first spaghetti photo? The first time your kid ever eats something really messy, whether it's squash or spaghetti, and they get it all over their face, and you take a photo. And she said, I took that photo, and I realized that was not my memory. I, if I uh, know that this child's going back home, I have to make sure that mom has that bond so that this baby can become healthy, you know, uh, and that mom can develop this bond. So she said, much to my husband's disagreement, I texted the photo. Bing, instantly, mom wrote back. And mom was so touched, and they had this interesting conversation. And she said, I, for the first time in two years, I saw bio mom as human. It humanized her. And she said, and as soon as I was able to shift and see her like that, instead of the one that ruined this little boy, or in her mind, at least at that point in time, she said, I said, what else can I do to help? And long story short, that mom, she helped get a job. And the mom had, was so incredible with all the support that foster mom gave bio mom, that bio mom got a job in the foster care system 
and of all things, became the, like the director of licensing of foster homes, who now licenses this woman <laughs> her home. So she even like went higher up on the food chain or work chain than the foster mom. So she said, the success is incredible, but it took me shifting how I see this mother. Well, think about our, so, it was, so the child welfare system. We have about 60 to, 60 to 80 percent, with conservative estimates, of the, of the cases, uh, the families that are in child welfare have substance use as a factor. Does anyone take a guess how many get identified? Usually less than 24 percent, sometimes 10, 8. So we're not picking it up. Well, it, that doesn't go away, right? Just because we don't see it, we don't pick it up, we don't, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It undermines that family's health and stability the whole time. So one of the jobs that we have if we're looking at partners is realizing that the opioid crisis, the one system that has been the most affected in terms of, if you look at the data, is the child welfare system because they were not prepared for this and their staff are not trained, they don't know what to expect, and they, are, they like, like the foster mom, don't always think very highly of the clients that we all will work with. So that's a huge, a huge um, challenge for us is to get them on board. Think about hospitals. We get many of our clients after they overdose. And, um, and, I, and I, do, I do like to use quotes. And so one of my favorite quotes from a hospital, um, and, and if you're not aware, there's a lot of efforts now where programs like yours will put a recovery support, a recovery coach in a hospital to when somebody overdoses, they're there to take that person and kind of help them navigate to a treatment program. Well, it sounds like a great idea, and, and, and it is, and it works in a lot of places, but because we don't have a lot of experience in some cases doing this, we missed a huge problem. And that is that, and this is a generalization, but in general, people that are in recovery are very passionate. And so they're there trying, they, trying to save this person and get them where they need to go, and they're, they're in the hospital with this overdose. And the emergency room staff, okay, are, they have what we call a workflow challenge, and they are, and they are very busy, and, and they're trying to save lives. And we, those don't always get along. We, have, we are now being called into hospitals to say, this partnership isn't working. Sounded great in a grant, sounded great in but it's not working because, for no other reason than, we didn't do our homework to help, help get those two systems to understand how each other worked. And, and here's what the hospital folks say. We never see anything good. I mean, think about it. Think about what, a, what, a, what is an emergency room. The people that are in there, many of them die, and, and, and if, they're not, if they don't die, their lives are often forever changed and not always in good ways. And um, the quote that, that I like is, um, and it, uh, some of you, if you watch TV, you'll know what this means. Um, they say that um, it's not like Grey's Anatomy. And, you know, it's not like there's, you know, uh, it's just all these lovely relationships are happening in the broom closet and whatever else is going on. That this is more like a horror movie. A horror movie in the ER with just terrible things that you can't even imagine happening. And they don't have the time necessarily, because they say, if I stop and talk to your recovery worker and help explain why I did and said and did what I did and said, I might lose the guy behind the curtain right here, because I'm working in seconds to save lives. And so once we take a step back and understand how different our roles are, but guess what? We all have the same goal. That's the good news. We all want these people to live, and we want them to go on to be productive members of our tribes and our communities. But not only do they say that it's um, not like Grey's Anatomy, they said, my workload would be cut in half if it weren't for meth and opioids. So these folks are exhausted. They, they've never seen anything like this. Now, those of you who work in treatment, you have a very happy thing you get to see, right? You get to see the people in recovery. You get to see these remarkable turnarounds. You get to see their transformations, how they totally transform their lives and how they can be successful. You don't see that in the ER, right? All they see is the gloom and the doom and the blood and the gore and, the, and they also think everyone's drug seeking, that they're there with fake injuries and sometimes they are to get medications. So there's this very jaded, very um, unhappy view of the people that we're saying, we need your help, we want to partner with you, we want you to work with us. 
So um, the, the, this taking the time in the beginning of your grant award to dig really deep in with these partnerships um, another one is domestic violence, and this is, if you're working with women and you don't have good domestic violence partners, that's a, a real missed opportunity, but, but here's something that I'll never forget um, happens there, and that is sometimes you have programs that want to go abstinence only. They're not on board with medication, and that's an evolution. Some people are, some aren't, some get there eventually, and, and what we, but what happens is sometimes in our effort to make this decision for the client and say, this is the right way. You should be going an abstinence only pro, uh, process. These moms, and so I've talked with hundreds of them, will say, you know what? They have no idea what happens when I leave that office where they give me the ab happy abstinence speech and why it's so important to be abstinent. And then when I'm abstinent, I go home and when I am having to be face down on a mattress and terrible things happening to me and humiliating things are happening to me and I'm being physically and sexually abused and everything else and I'm having to do it straight up, that's like having surgery without anesthesia. And that, that I never thought of it like that. You know, we want to say, well, then get, the, get rid of this partner, right? Get rid of them. You've, you've got to leave that person. Well, who are we to say that? Because the most dangerous time that you leave is when you leave. So who are we to say from our safety of our car, our house, our desk, just leave that SOB, you know? And then and you'd be absent and everything's great. And so to, I think we have to be aware that the, the pathways that many of these um, individuals that come to us for care travel ha are a lot more complicated. And so, um, and require a lot of very individualized um, analysis. Some may be absolutely ready to go abstinence only, and, and that might be their preferred, and we always want the individual to also have, you know, have that, a, a key piece of that decision-making. Obviously, it's their life. Um, but sometimes we do what I call bumper sticker therapy. You know, we come up with these short, little helpful, meaning to be helpful, we're all well-meaning, but we accidentally put people in jeopardy that we would never mean to put in jeopardy because we want what's best for them, and we think we know what that is. Um, and, and, and we don't, usually. It, that takes time. And so by working with domestic violence partners, then you understand that how lethal these certain opportunities are and you realize like, I'm not going to sign someone's death warrant by recommending something that I don't have the expertise in or if I don't know what that pathway is that she is walking. So uh, domestic violence partners are key. By the way, we brought them in um, to our program and had them work with all the children because they grew up watching domestic, they, they don't know what a healthy relationship looks like. So we do what we call two and three generation services. You, you, if you can, you never want to do one generation services. And SAMHSA had a lot of foresight in their grant when they talked about prevention. You want to do two or three or more generation services by taking that opportunity you have and um, providing as much, um, you know, support and therapy and therapeutic uh, assistance and prevention and everything else that you that your grant will allow you to do or that your partnerships will allow you to do. Um, housing. It is real hard to get solid recovery and to do medication compliance, like taking daily. I mean, think of, think of us. I mean, how many of us can do something every single day and you have to kind of take it at the same time so that your blood levels are all good? That, think about the chaos that many of these families live in, their daily existence. And we have our, you know, our day timers and our smartphones and our little little bells that, you know, alarms that go off and remind us to take our medicine or what have you. We have a roof over our head. We have, you know, all of this. Um, many of these clients are sofa surfing. They don't even have a solid roof over their head. They don't know where they're going to be one day to the next. And so we give them this, you know, medication um, that they might not always be able to take. And so in that instance, we have to really take a step back and say, what can we do to get that that family safe housing. And one of the grantees that I believe is in this room that talked to us before the, um, on one of the other webinars said, guess what percentage of my public housing is, in, is uninhabitable now because of the mostly meth crisis. But does anyone want to take a guess? 80%. 80% of his housing is because it's pu public housing is contaminated by the meth, and you have to go in in hazmat suits and hazmat suits, and you have to do this decontamination process that costs ten thousand dollars. 
And so it's like a vicious cycle. They don't have the money to redo these houses to put people in, that then it happens again, and, then, and, and they're never getting out of this spinning circle. So as you think about who your partners would be for sustainability, it's not that you are calling them up, hey, I need a letter of support for my grant. I need this, I need that, I need referrals. If you're going to do true authentic partnerships, it's not about you, it's about them. It's about what they're obviously playing a role in the life of the person you're trying to work with and they have something to offer and so do you. And so one of the things you have to be able to do is help them understand how things work and what these you know, clients experience and how we can all work together. So when I ran the Safe Port program in Key West, um, I went and sat down with the hospital and I said, um, you know, we're kind of, we're having this new program, we want to work with you, what do we need? And they said, hold on a minute. And I, I sat there a while and finally someone comes in and he says, you know what, if you can do one thing for me, I'll find a way to fund you. I'll find a way to even maybe split resources with you. I said, what's that? He said, get all of your clients to quit using the emergency room for primary care. They don't do anything. Their kids, you know, have fevers and this and that. They don't take them for all of their proactive appointments. And then they race them into the emergency room at 2 and 3 in the morning. And acute care is very expensive. And they said, can you help us keep these folks out of the emergency room? Because we are going bankrupt. And you have, these are your families. And I'm, I remind them that we, these are all of our families. You know, we all see them in a different way. And we all have a, a role to play. But, um... So what did we have to do? So we thought, wow, that wasn't in our grant. You know, we don't have a line item for that. What are we going to do? And so we found some nurses who were willing to come and run groups that would teach parents. Because see, we assume they have all these skills, and they don't. At least that's what, what we learned. So we taught them how to be more proactive with their children, how to make, how to figure out who a primary care provider would be, how to go have a doctor's appointment and how to be responsible about that and what to expect and that they might have to wait and what questions should they ask. And we went with them to show them how to do it and to be there if they needed that support. And pretty soon we reduced that emergency room uh, from at least our clients significantly. And then, by the way, it made our night staff very happy because they were not liking to have to run to the emergency room at 2 and 3 and 4 in the morning. So um, it wasn't about us. And yet, as a result, we got some resources that we didn't necessarily plan on. And again, it's all about being able to, it's about your partnerships, and it's also about sustainability. So um, then we also have a situation of um, the uh, workforce. So right now, you've, pro you've probably heard that we've lost essentially a whole generation of young adults, mostly men, from the opioid crisis who are not in our workforce now, either because they've passed away or because they, have a di they are disabled through their significant use. So uh, I, I Uber everywhere. I'm, I fly all over the country, and I, was, and I always love to talk to Uber drivers, or as my husband calls them to my 21-year-old daughter's dismay, Uber, and she just cringes when he does that. But So I always like to talk to them. What, what do you see? What's going on? So when this one Uber driver last week learned I was doing something with opioid, he said, let me tell you my story. He said, I had a successful flooring business. I had more business than I knew what to do with. And he said, but you know what happened? The opioid crisis started happening. And pretty soon my guys were coming and they were absolutely out of it. They were not, they weren't showing up on time. When they showed up, they weren't doing you know, it correctly. And he said, one day I made the mistake of saying, just get out of the way, I'll do it, because they had to move a heavy bookcase. And guess what happened? Fell on him. Now, he ended up on long-term page management, and he ended up losing his whole business, because he, he went from you know, doing what his doctor told him to do, and then ended up years later with still needing um, and, and you, of course, you build such tolerance to these pain medications that they don't hold you anymore. So you end up having to do more and use on top. And so all of these things become very complicated. So what I want to do is see if there's any others before we, we start uh, seeing what some of your, oh, the behavioral health providers. So many of you are behavioral health providers and many of you are not. And you're counting on working with other behavioral health providers. And so some of the conversations we've had are that I want to provide recovery support for my tribe and I want to do more um, culturally relevant programming. But we don't do medication-assisted treatment. That's done 20 miles up the road. And so how do we make this happen? 
you know, how do we then get them on board to, to then increase their workload to serve our clients and how do, we, how do we do that? And of course you could do a whole session just on that one partnership. Um, but one of the things we talked about was, uh, and there's two angles here, one is that Yes, they are, they're doing the medical part. This, this particular example I'm giving you does the medication-assisted treatment, but they're not doing anything tribally relevant. So what's going to happen is over time, they're going to see two or three outcomes that are not going to go well. They're going to have people that, do not, um, that, that don't engage with treatment because it doesn't make sense to them. It's a, maybe a sterile medical model that, they don't, that doesn't fit or they uh, get engaged, but they don't stay engaged. So we have a retention problem, or then we have, you know, they don't complete. But perhaps you could get a baseline. You could say to them, hey, can, we'll work with you, and we're, we're gonna do something we think will boost your incomes, our outcomes, all of our outcomes. And so what we'd like to do is would, we, would you share with us your baseline? You know, not by name, but we had 50 clients last year. And of those 50 clients, uh, 40, made it for two months and we lost some more and by the end we had this many stay successfully for a year and you know come up with some definition of what their baseline looked like last year now moving forward with your grant award now we're adding clubhouses or we're adding peer support or we're doing recovery other recovery support um, we're providing transportation we're doing barrier reduction and so um, what do we need to do you know how does that then change the outcomes with those clients um, and and they, there are so many barriers. The barriers are incredible. And a lot of our substance abuse colleagues that aren't doing work in opioid sometimes don't understand barriers. And we have these very aggravating conversations like where they'll say, oh, you can't help them, like come help pick them up or take them there or help them connect to care because that's enabling. Okay, these are concepts that we don't use anymore or many of us don't use anymore because People's lives are at stake. We need to keep them alive, folks, long enough that we can get this figured out, that we can try all the different things that we know how to do. And so um, last week when I was in Tallahassee, I met clients that were spending two hours on a van each way to go to a methadone program every day. That's four hours. And I said to myself, how long do you think they're going to last? I mean, do, do anyone in this room really think that that full van that spends four hours. That's not, it's two hours driving, two hours back, not including waiting, right? Because you wait when you get there. Everybody has to get their medication or their counseling. Um, I, will, I will almost bet my, everything in my bank account, not a whole lot, but I'm willing to bet that almost none are still riding the van. So we didn't do a real good job in that instance problem solving that barrier, okay? And this happens every day. So we have a lot of work to do with our, you know, our collaborative partners to figure out how to do some more barrier reduction and how to, um, you know, some of, and, and the other thing we do, drive by treatment. We take someone with 10 years, a decade of using substances, of domestic violence, of all these problems, and we say, why don't you pop into the outpatient program a couple hours a week, and outpatient's usually 90 days, and, and, and we're good. And, and you've probably heard the saying, it takes three years to walk into the woods, it probably takes three years to walk back out. There's not a lot of shortcuts here. And so if we're, we're setting people up to fail, if we're not making sure that whatever package we provide is sufficiently robust and aligns with what kinds of barriers they're experiencing. And these are all, these are all the things that we've learned in implementing grants that they're the things you kind of know, but you don't always anticipate them in your um, work with your partnerships. So what I'd like to do now is to stop for a minute and talk about, from, ask you all, what um, experiences have you had that, um, let's say, with, with any of these systems, we didn't talk about them all, but with either um, child welfare, um, the um, housing providers, with um, the workforce, with fellow substance abuse agencies, or with um, hospital and health care. Has, has, would anybody like to share something that either a lesson they learned or some model that they have found uh, particularly successful? Or that they would like to ask the rest of the group, hey, can you help me? This is where we're really struggling. And any system will work. And while you're, while you're, pardon me? 
Uh, uh, there aren't any more. I mean, not on that topic. Um, so, so basically, um, and let me give you one example too while we're, while we're doing this. Some of us know that our, these families need residential, but the grant didn't pay for it or healthcare insurance doesn't like to pay for residential. Well, what we've been able to do is go to apartment complexes and say, hey, can we move a bunch of families into your apartment complex? We'll get TANF, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, to pay, help subsidize their rent. We'll house some of our recovery staff on site and we will simulate a residential where maybe a couple of moms and children or teenagers can live. And um, it, it, it doesn't cost, it's, you literally bill outpatient, you can bill Medicaid in most instances. And, it, and the apartments will say, oh my goodness, no, I don't want drug users in my apartments. And you have to say, huh, who do you think's living in there right now? You know, uh, most of the long-term drug using folks are not homeowners, they've lost everything. They're renters, okay? So how, how, so either you're renting to people you don't know, that you know a, a fairly high percentage are substance users, or your, your other choices will come in. We will work, these folks will get drug testing, they'll get you know, trauma therapy, they'll get counseling, they'll get medication. We'll come in and show them how to clean the apartments, how to shop for food, how to raise their children. We'll be good neighbors, we'll sweep the, the walkways, we'll, be, we'll, we'll teach them how to live in a community. And then they're fighting for the chance to, to, to do this. And this has happened all over the country. So that's an example of you know, how to kind of simulate a level of care without having to spend a lot of money. So uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. I don't think it's on. Good afternoon. OK. So my name's Anita Mendoza. I work with Yakima Nation, which is located in the state of Washington. And so on tribal lands, on the reservation, we do have an IHS clinic, but there's no map. And um, so Yakima County, Yakima City, they do have some locations where they do have some medica medication assisted treatments. But the hospital located in Toppenish, um, and it's not on the reservation, it's, it's the top, Toppenish um, Hospital they have there, they decided to do a detox, a withdrawal detox, and then um, implement the map. So what we did was um, we start collaborating with them. And, and so um, trying to find a way to help our community be able to get the map, because I, we have no idea when our clinic is going to be able to provide the map. So we had to come up with a solution, or try to come up with a mm -hmm. solution, and that was what we did as a solution. Can I ask, because one of our TAs today said that their IHS does not approve of uh, medication and their grant didn't have enough money to really buy a lot of medication. And so I said, I'm pretty certain that there's lots of examples where we have IHS as a good medication partner. And does it make sense to have, you know, in my world, you, you know, a principal talks to a principal, a judge talks to a judge, you know, you have that kind of same food group to food group plan. And it usually goes over a lot better than someone else trying to do that. Are there folks in this room that have had good experiences getting IHS to pay for medication um, assisted treatment that might even be willing if that um, IHS office was willing to have a conversation? No commitment, just a conversation. Yes? You didn't mean to raise your hand? <laughs> okay. Um, so, and so maybe we understood that wrong. So there, there we're going we right here. Okay. Uh, in Alaska, IHS, uh, Alaska Native Medical Center, does pay for medication-assisted treatment. They pay for Suboxone. And then uh, Sublocade just came out on the market, so we do have a contract with Magellan. That, uh, and Medicaid does pay for uh, medication-assisted treatment, so that's part of our screening question as well. So uh, we have a con, uh, I believe that we, because Sublicade just came out on the market and IHS is working on that, uh, and it's on the formulary at ANMC that our specific clinic, because we do use Sublicade so much, mm -hmm. that we contact uh, the head pharmacist at ANMC and we will get reimbursed. That is my understanding mm -hmm. since I do a lot of medication order. So I only have one patient that I need to do that with. Um, but that would be a question if you know if they do have Medicaid because Medicaid will pay for it. Uh, That's so. great to know. 
And so maybe those of you who are having difficulties, you might want to see this grantee to see, you know, if there's any opportunity to, to have some cross-pollination of, of uh, you know, conversations. Um, also, we know that some people are very slow to um, get involved with medication, but if they're going to do it, they'll, they'll agree to naltrexone. And that's often because, you know, if you, if you do the shot, you get it once a month. So, and for domestic violence victims, you know, remember that in domestic violence, that usually the perpetrator uses, can use medication as a chemical tool. So either you do da 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 whatever I want you to do, or you're not gonna get your Suboxone dose. And, and I'll talk tomorrow about well, what happens when that happens. And it is miserable. So then often that person will do whatever they have to do to be able to get their dose again, because they're, that's the perpetrator holding that. Um, you can't take the shot away, right? You come in once a month and you get the shot. Now some people complain that you get it in your buttocks and that it's a little uncomfortable and that sometimes they think about it a lot because when they sit down, they're aware that they have a shot. And when it finally goes away, then they get the other side. So they, you, know, you alternate. But, that, but a lot of people don't have problems with this or that it's a minor inconvenience for the fact that they will not crave and they won't be dope sick. It won't be in withdrawal. And they can go about their lives. And you know what? I haven't met anybody who wants to be on medications for a long period of time. This is a problem that you're going to have if you haven't already with some of the treatment providers, especially ones that have not been involved with opioid treatment. They'll say, well, how long do they have to be on there, on this medication? And we think, you know what? Nobody would ever ask that of somebody who has a mental health medication. You don't say, well, finally you got stable. You're not wanting to kill yourself anymore. You finally have joy back in your life, so we're going to yank your meds away. We would never do that. But the very first question a lot of people will ask, and child welfare is big on this, is um, we're not going to give you your kids back. Imagine that. We are not. There's a lawsuit right now in West Virginia. We are not going to give you your kids back. You choose between your recovery medication and your children. And, and what, who does that? That's a terrible choice to give someone. That's not even a choice. And so um, don't, I don't know how that lawsuit will go. But in that instance, you know, even 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 if they just start with the naltrexone, because you, you can't get high on it, nobody diverts naltrexone. It doesn't, it doesn't help you to divert it. It doesn't, you know, if you get a shot, how are you going to get it back out? You know what I mean? It doesn't leave, okay? It doesn't leave. Um, and that does have, with Suboxone, we do have, and you'll hear this, and you have to be prepared for this if you have not experienced this. Some of your clients will split do their dose. They'll take it from your program, and they'll sell it on the street, or they'll give it to others. But you know what, folks? They're not setting up a, you know, a, a big, you know, um, massive uh, money-making scheme. These are people that are in survival mode. It might put the rent on the, you know, food on the table or put cover their rent. If, so they split. They go into withdrawal just so that they can make enough money selling the other. It doesn't say it's right, and we don't overlook all of this. We certainly hold people accountable. But what we have to say is that's really not a good solution. If you're having trouble putting food on the table, putting a roof over your head, let's help you figure that out so that you don't end up getting kicked off the program for diversion. So, you know, you don't have really diversion with naltrexone. So maybe that's something I had a conversation with one of the grantees. Maybe you can get someone to start with that medication to at least stop them so that they can, so that their brain is able to heal with all that, the neurochemistry that goes on with the opioid use. It takes a long time for that to get better. And so it's like a, it was best described to me by a physician who said, if you land an airplane and you have ruts in the, ruts in the, um, in the runway, if you land in a plane and you look down on the runway, you'll see these like digged in, you know, and that that is what's happening to your brain. You have so much damage and neurochemical problems from your opioid use that takes time to heal. And the medication, all it does is stabilize that so you can function. But, um, you know, some are on it for longer periods than others. It's a very individual situation. We had a question in the back, sir. Thank you. Pharmacy to have have those medications added, and it, that gets those medications into the community a lot a lot quicker, and it gives you those reimbursable services that really make those programs sustainable. That's an excellent solution, and we talked about that earlier. What is it, like an eight-hour data waiver? Uh, and I think the uh, ATTC offers it. Yeah. And, it's I mean, not it, a heavy lift. No, it's not, it, and it, it is a way to get 
you know, Suboxone at least into the community a lot quicker. And we've been able at Bonillac to get Suboxone and Vivitrol added to our formulary. And thank you. Now, Traxone, when I use that term, a lot of you may know that as Vivitrol. And, and it's used for alcohol. The one good thing, only, the only good thing I can think of about the opioid crisis is we do at least have a medication that keeps people alive while they get the treatment they need. Um, and, and it works for alcohol, too. These, uh, although somebody, I think it was Joel, said they're seeing success with methamphetamines. And so if you're not aware, you're going to see these hand in hand. It's called speedballing. So somebody ends up, you know, you get all jacked up on methamphetamine, and you can't maintain that. And so then they take either alcohol or they'll take some um, opioids to kind of chill, calm things down. And then if they're not getting their case plan met or they're missing appointments or whatever they're doing, and then they, you know, need to put a skip in their step, then they're using meth. Um, in, in, our, in Florida, about 90% of opioid users are using other substances. Um, so uh, just know that obviously that's not the only one. It might be the major one. It might be the one most responsible for their uh, potential death if they overdose. We have a lot of withdrawal uh, management, what we call detox. We used to call it detox, called withdrawal management programs, that are literally detoxing people and letting them out the door. And you might as well just write a death sentence for them. If you let them out the door after being detoxed without either naltrexone, you know, Vivitrol, or some medication, or take them physically, and you should, if they do the medication, it should happen right there. You don't want five minutes. You don't want them to walk from one building to another on the same hospital campus alone. Not five minutes. We've learned this the hard way, how many people we've lost. This is where your recovery support workers, your recovery coaches, coaches are literally saving lives every day because they won't leave their side till they get connected to where they need to go. Um, so those are some hard lessons we learned. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Roy Pack of Drug Event Tribal Leaders, and not so much a question, but just to share an experience we had with, with what he said and what you said. Part of our grant was written, and I, too, picked up the grant three months after they got it and walked in blind into the whole thing. And part of the grant was to start a Torah program. But we weren't in any position whatsoever to start a Torah program, so I started researching and found a few things. There were 15 providers in Billings, Montana that were, um, had their MAT certifications, their DEA waiver and everything for it. I found one of those that was willing to work with us. The Urban Center had been shut down. Um, the Urban Indian Health Center had been shut down. It just opened up. They were starting to get things developed. They had behavioral health. So between the three of us connecting us with our peer-to-peers, them with behavioral health and a clinic that's standing there, and the physician staying there and creating an, an MOU between the three, okay. boom, we got a MAP program wow. up and going. Nobody owns it. We're all working together yeah. to do it. Then reaching out even farther with that, I discovered that the state has their SOR grants, their STR grants, right. and through the state, we brought in integrated behavioral health training that the state paid for, offered 23 CEUs. It was a five-day class, included MAT training, put that all together, and got even more people trained wow. in that area. Then working with the state in collaboration, too, they're training us as naloxone master trainers, so we can train our peers, police officers, and people mm -hmm. in the community they're giving us um, kits for ready sets wow. for testing for hep C, um, all the supplies to do syringe exchanges we, and helped us find another grant for 5,000 to actually buy syringes. And then through a fluke, two of the pharmacies in town that were doing medication drop-offs, the mm -hmm. big boxes look like mailboxes, mm -hmm. Shopco, they were closing down. They needed a home for two of those. Wow. Picked both of those up. And it was just playing connect the dots, Connecting the dots. with that. And, and mm -hmm. at the same time, something that we built off of is our track peer-to-peer -peer program in Billings. Started out with one of our peers hanging out downtown and got to know one of the police officers that walked the streets downtown with all the homeless, which is over 80% native. Mm -hmm. Well, started working with them and started working with those homeless people as peers, and they start seeing the numbers of arrests and reports go down. Yes. Became partners with them. That peer now works for the, the city mm -hmm. in their... Uh, drug court program, they hired two more police officers to work downtown, and all four of them, the peer-to-peer -peer and the three police officers, worked together with that homeless population of natives downtown right. to get them off the streets, get them into treatment, things like that. And do we have a MAP program? No. Do we have any kind of behavioral health program? No. But we did satisfy the requirements of the grant by just playing connect the dots. And you're saving lives. And, and yeah. even to use the naloxone example, I, I know we're going to wrap this up. 
but I live in a town with 1,500 people, so I can't go anywhere, like to the grocery store or eat at a restaurant without people. Miss Pam, I got a quick question, and nothing's quick. It's like you know, you're, you know, your food's gonna get cold, and so you eat at home. But anyway, here's the number one question I get: How many times do we have to revive the same client, the same person over? And they look at me, and how do you, my my? You could, if you read my thought bubble, I would probably be expelled for foul language, because my thought is. You've got to be kidding me. And so finally, I, I was really speechless the first time, but now I have a really good comeback. And so I, I say one of two things. One is, well, wow, you must have, unless you got a big promotion and, you, and you're like now making life and death decisions, you know, as a higher power, I would say the short answer is every time. You revive them every time. And I said, and let me ask you something. I know that your son, he drives a big pickup truck and races around on the interstate. He's always, you can hear him coming a mile away. And so he's wrecked a few times. I said, how would you feel if when he wrecked, we said, okay, Dylan, we're gonna, we're gonna scrape you off the road this time and we're gonna put you back and you're gonna be all right, but you, but you better not do it again. And then he does, because that's what happens, right, with some of these behaviors. And then we say, oh, we're just gonna let you go because we know if we save you, you're just gonna go race that car again. We don't, nobody does that, but we do it for this disease of opioid. The stigma, the shame, the blame is so heavy that it is amazing we even get these folks. We even have the honor of being able to try to help them um, and that they trust us with their care because they have not had good experiences out there. And they say, you, they don't have to say anything. The health providers, the EMTs, you know, we can tell, we see it in their eyes, their disdain, that, that we'll hear them mocking. They'll hear them, they don't think they hear them telling them that they're scumbags. And so, and I'm not saying that that happens everywhere, but for those of you who are doing naloxone, kits, please put the education with it to help humanize these folks and to remind them that, you know, yeah, it might be a couple of times because we don't have magic dust. Um, they, they took years and years for them to develop these problems and they're not going to go away overnight no matter how well-meaning we are. Um, I know we're out of time, um, but I do want to say to the gentleman that just connected like 72 dots in four and a half minutes that um, uh, uh, but one of my colleagues, who's one of your GPOs, Ramon Bonzon, um, is a great uh, proponent of peer-to-peer -peer technical assistance. And there's so much experience in this room of people who have already solved some of these problems that many of you might not even know you're fixing to have. You know, you, 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 you'll find out next week or the week after. But just know that between calling the ATTC, between calling your project officer, between you know, uh, calling your peers, or if you just, you know, give, give us a holler and say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. We'll try to match you with some folks that might have done well in those areas. There, there is no end of the reservoir of assistance that you can get from each other. Um, and we have some limited ability to do that also through uh, our current contract. So uh, we appreciate everything you're doing. Um, and for those of you who, you know, had the fancy grant writer and are now in total sticker shock looking at what you, what you have to implement now, um, please don't be afraid to speak up if you have questions uh, or would like any help. Yes? American Indian Alaska Native ATTC could set a blog up for people in this program to ask questions mm -hmm. and have them reviewed and people respond. Uh, there's another thing about that for our SAMHSA people that might actually help us understand how effective we are in getting the word out and the communication in. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. Okay, anything else? Going, going, gone. Um, we appreciate so much your uh, questions, and we'll be all ar around here for the next uh, day and a half, uh, or I guess it's going, or, or longer, depending on the weather. I don't know if anyone's looked outside. Um, but at any rate, and I think next, do we have James? Where's Harold? What's, what? We're going to take a break until 3.30, and then we have our last speaker, uh, James Ward, who's going to provide some very practical, hands-on uh, discussion with you about assessment and more. Thank you. Oh, I guess I should give. Thanks. Thank you for being available. Can you do this for me? I don't know. I'm not very good at this.